Hello everybody, welcome to the Cheeky Neurons and today we are here talking to Dr. Matthias Maturana. Maturana. Maturana, I'm sorry, I've been getting that wrong the whole time I've been sitting here. <laughs> Maturana, who is from a research fellow from the University of Melbourne who works out of St Vincent's Hospital. Matthias, thank you so much for joining us. A pleasure. Matthias, you work with, uh, your, your, your research involves surgeries for people with epilepsy but it's a new type of surgery that's kind of just mm. being developed can you tell us a little bit about that so just to be clear i don't, I don't do the surgery you don't do myself. the surgery <laughs> yes um, i work more on the technology and um and the placement of the electrodes yeah so that's i guess the new part of it so we have um we're working with deep brain stimulation mm -hmm. and deep brain stimulation i think it's commonly used many people might have heard it heard of it for Parkinson's disease, but maybe not heard of, heard of it for epilepsy. So what we're doing is we're implanting these electrodes, which are essentially wires that go into the brain, maybe 10, 10 centimeters into the brain, roughly. And they go into an area called the hippocampus, two of them into the hippocampus on the left and the right side, mm -hmm. and then another two in the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. It's another part of the brain. Right. And we can record from those areas and we can also stimulate neurons in those areas as well. Right, so you're, you're recording the activity of neurons yes. that are sending messages around those parts of the brain. Yes. Why have you particularly chosen those parts of the brain? Yeah. Or why are those parts of the brain important to what you do? Yeah, so what, I guess one of the really the important things that we're trying to do is predict when a seizure is going to occur. And this is something that's very difficult to do, but what we've found with other research as well is that there are some patterns in the neural responses um, that change over time. That, that tell you, give you an indication of how susceptible a patient is to a seizure. And what we're going, what we're doing now is one step further from that. We can apply a very small stimulation to the neurons and see how they respond mm -hmm. to that stimulation. It's called an evoked response. Right. And the size of that evoked response um, tells you how excitable those circuits are in the in the brain. And if they're more excitable, they're more susceptible to a seizure, essentially. Ah, so if they're more excitable when they receive that stimulation yes. from one of those electrodes in the brain, yes. then that tells you that that person is more susceptible to having a seizure. That's right. At that particular time That's of the right. day or the exactly. week or... At the, well, good question as well, because um, people have these changes, these rhythms in their signals that fluctuate over, in some cases hours, in some cases days, right. and up to maybe a week or so or, or longer. So we do see these changes in the responses of the neurons um, over variable time scales, and that's variable across patients or even between in, in, in an individual patient as well. Right. Um, and using those rhythms, we can work out how susceptible they are to a seizure. But what mm. we're really looking for is when we apply that stimulus, how big is the response that tells us how excitable those neurons are, the circuits in those between those two locations, mm -hmm. and, um, and we can then apply counter stimulation. Yes. Apply stimulation to maybe lower the susceptibility or lower the excitability of the brain to a seizure. Right. Yeah. So you're applying stimulation to stop all of that electrical signaling in the brain. To that disrupt sounds it. Yes. Oh, it's to disrupt, disrupt it. it. To disrupt it, yes. Right. So okay. it doesn't stop it. Um, it disrupts it. So, I mean, normal functioning still takes place. And the patients don't actually even notice anything. Any changes have occurred. Right. Um, but what we're trying to do is disrupt the, the pathways that would make the seizure propagate throughout the entire brain. And right. so maybe they might have a micro seizure still in the seizure focus, but that won't propagate to the entire brain and won't cause a seizure for the patient. Right, okay, so so how is this different perhaps from the deep brain stimulation that people might have heard of before yeah. in conditions like Parkinson's disease? How is this different and how will that lead yeah. to helping people with epilepsy? I guess the main difference is that we can record the responses and that's a really right. important thing because um, just with deep brain stimulation, if we just apply deep brain stimulation, we still rely on a subjective outcome from the patient telling us that they're feeling better or that they're feeling worse. And mm -hmm. the same with medication, you know, we trial many different types of medications and it takes a long time for the clinician to work out this medication is actually working for this sure. patient. Um, but in this case, what we can do is we can respond, re record the responses in the neurons and get the ground truth of how excitable mm -hmm. those neurons are and how well the stimulation is working for that particular patient. 
So it's still important whether the patient is feeling better or not. Absolutely. But sometimes they might not be able to pick up that yeah, activity that's in the right, brain. That's right. They might not. They not might not notice it. That's right. And right. we know that seizures cause a lot of memory loss. For example, so some right. patients they will have a seizure, but they won't remember it the next day that they've had a seizure. But you know, there will be changes in their body. They'll feel lethargic. They might not perform so well the rest mm -hmm. of that day, etc. Mm -hmm. So we know from previous studies that there's a lot of seizures that are actually missed by the patients. Right. Um, and an individual patient might have many different types of seizures as well. So mm -hmm. some of the ones that are really um, noticeable and noticeable to other people around them as well, and some that are far less noticeable. For example, the ones that happen in sleep. Right. Um, okay. And of course, they wouldn't then be able to report that to their clinician to right. say, yes, this medication or yes, yes, this stimulation is working. That's right. That's in right. those cases of seizures. That's right. Right. So we get a ground truth, I guess, of how well the stimulation and even medication is working for yep. the patient. But also we get some extra information that allows us to predict when a seizure is occurring or mm -hmm. about to occur. And then use that information to apply the stimulation as required. Not just constantly applying stimulation as deep brain stimulation normally does, yep. but we can say, you know, this is when we need to apply it and only apply it at those right. necessary times. Right, so it's really targeted stimulation Absolutely. to those times when the person is most susceptible. Yes. And then you're interrupting that neural network, yes. you're telling them to stop sending all those messages around their network, yes. and that prevents the seizure from spreading throughout the brain. That's right, yes. And people can go about their normal everyday function. Yeah, so we have. Um, one patient where this is working extremely well in at the moment, um, and that we've only just turned the stimulation on recently with that patient, and already they've seen a significant drop in the number of seizures. They're still having seizures, mm -hmm. but not nearly as many as they were without the stimulation. Mm -hmm. And the other important thing is that what this patient is reporting is that when they have a seizure, they don't actually have that feeling of feeling lethargic afterwards, they can actually get back to their life and oh. continue functioning. So even though they have this thing, this seizure that disrupts their activity for a, a small period of time, mm -hmm. they get back to work afterwards, they don't have to sleep at all. Does that mean that the seizure is is reduced, can you say severity? Yeah, is absolutely. It, yeah, right. That's what the indication is. Yeah, this okay, yes. so even, even if they do have a seizure, it's reduced severity to yes. what they've previously yes. been experiencing. Yeah. And how long... Has this patient you're just you're describing had this implant or these electrodes implanted in their brain? So the patient's been implanted since March. Right. But the stimulation has only been on for the last two or three weeks. So we've only right. just turned it on. So there is a period at the beginning where we need to work out how the brain responds to just very small pulses of stimulation. Um, and also just how the brain functions in general sure. between the electrodes that we're reporting from. Mm -hmm. So we had that period at the beginning. And of then, about six months that yeah, period. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And then, um, and then we turn stimulation on. Recently. Right. So, right. And, and already we see exciting a, results. An exciting result already in just two or three and weeks. And what about regular um, anti-epileptic drugs? Has, yes. has this patient been able to reduce or, or take, re remove those Absolutely. medications? That is the hope that we right. will get there. At, the, at this stage, we're not interfering with that at all. Sure. So we're not changing the, the normal um, uh, therapy. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that if we can stop these seizures from happening, then they can reduce the medication or even go off the medication entirely. Because a lot of the medication has unwanted side effects as well. Absolutely. So, that sounds like that would be such an experience of freedom yeah, for someone who's absolutely. been on anti-epileptic drugs to mm -hmm. be able to take them out of the equation mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not have all of those side absolutely. effects. Yeah. So you say you've implanted this... Um, uh, electrode array, if you, do you call it an array? Yeah, yeah, what, do yeah. you, what do you call an it? An electrode array, yeah. An electrode array. You've implanted this electrode array so far in yes. one patient That's and right. you're having very positive results yes. from that so far. What's the next step in this research? So the, we have another four patients going to be implanted very soon um, and we'll see how well this generalises across different patients as well, right. this result. And the, the hope is that it works extremely well for mm -hmm. all patients. Um, and then the next step is making devices, I guess, that are a little bit smarter, that can use this information, um, that can maybe record a bit higher quality and also really uh, predict when the seizure is going to occur, mm -hmm. and using that information to just stop it from happening altogether. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, this device is not so smart in that regard, but, um, but that's what we, we need the data for. Absolutely, so, it's all it's all a progression. You can't right, get the smarter right. device without this one that's that we're right. using right exactly. now. Exactly. Another four patients who are going to have this 
um, procedure. Yes. And then how long do you think you'll be recording data from that total of five? Mm -hmm. So I guess the study is that we record each patient for roughly about a year. Right. Ideally, I mean, in the clinical setting, if this was to be a clinical product, we don't expect that it would take that long. Mm -hmm. We really don't know, I, I guess there's always with these studies, unexpected outcomes and unexpected results and so we really have this period of one year recording mm -hmm. um, but the advantage of having a device that can record for the rest of the, the lifetime of a patient is that if we later down the track we see that the stimulation is actually not working as well as it was at the beginning we can see why that might be in terms mm -hmm. of the responses and then we can adjust the stimulation accordingly mm -hmm. or if we even with the drugs as well if we see that at the later stage um, a particular drug that was working previously is no longer working we can look at the neural responses and we'll try and work out where that change occurred and why sure. that change occurred as well and then apply a therapy accordingly as well. Yeah. So that's the advantage of having this long-term recording. For this study, ideally we're going to have a, a years long recording, mm -hmm. but the idea is that if we have devices that are capable of recording, we can always turn that feature back on and apply it as necessary. Are the people that you're using in this initial part of your research um, with these electrode arrays, are they all of a similar age or a similar type of epilepsy or is there a range? Uh, so age-wise there's no restriction but there is um, there is a type of epilepsy that we're targeting at the moment. Right. It's called nodular heterotopia. Nodular heterotopia. That's right. Okay. It's a type of epilepsy that's caused through malformation of the cortex during development. Mm -hmm. And the cortex is a, is a layer of neurons that lines the outside of the brain. Right, that's the wrinkly outside that's layer, right, wrinkly, isn't it? Wrinkly yeah. outside layer of the brain. And during formation of the brain, you know, the neurons migrate to the peripheral parts of the brain. Right. But in this in these type of patients, they'll have a part of the cortex that didn't migrate properly. So they'll have this kind of what we call a nodule mm -hmm. of, of these neurons in somewhere in the middle of the brain. So what that means for these patients is that surgery is generally not an option for them. Mm -hmm. um, quite often drugs don't work so well and there's very little other options. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, it's a perfect case where electrical stimulation can work to disrupt that activity from those, from those areas of the brain. Right. Um, so we are targeting these, this type of epilepsy for the moment. Mm -hmm. Our hypothesis is that this would work for definitely for different types of focal epilepsies mm -hmm. and hopefully also for generalised epilepsy as well. Right, that's fantastic. Yeah. That's such interesting work that you're mm. doing. Um, I would love it if we could talk about this all day, but I think we've probably overloaded most of the people who <laughs> are watching us today. So Matthias, I'd like to thank you again very, very much for explaining this really exciting um, clinical research that's going on. Mm -hmm. And I really hope that we might be able to talk to you about it again, maybe That'd in a great. year's time. Yeah, yeah. so see we should have exciting results then. So. See how that's going. Yeah, Thanks so much. Thank you.